I have Dooney Johnson on the YouTube channel with me, and he has accumulated over 130 doors in less than two years of real estate investing. And he has a, a few methods to his madness, and I'm going to ask him a few questions about how he got started. But Dooney, thanks for thanks for joining the pod. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to do it. Heck yeah. Well, hey, first question, just tell us about yourself and how'd you get started in the world of real estate investing? Happy year, I went on a road trip and um, I met a friend of my mom's that she went to high school with. And this guy was a real estate guru. He had a ton of followers on Instagram, like over 50, 100,000 followers on Instagram. He uh, drove the nicest cars. He had a bachelor pad on, on the rooftop down in LA. And he was a real estate um, professional. That's what he did. He did fix and flips and turnkey rentals using other people's money kind of in, in uh, cheaper markets over in Western Pennsylvania and things like that. And so I, when I met him, uh, what he did really seemed to intrigue me. I've always kind of had the, the thought and the idea. And part of the reason I want to take that gap year of I really didn't want to trading an hour for a dollar amount to me is really tough knowing I can make myself worth so much more during that hour. Like I can make my time worth more than just whatever someone's going to pay me for it. And so kind of having that idea when I saw what he was doing and just his hours were limitless on what he can make per hour. I asked him to shadow him for a week and he actually ended up offering me a full-time job to work remotely from home. And so I was like, I took him up on that. I said, sure, let's give this a shot. Um, and so, yeah, I went back and I started working for him. And like I said, we did a lot of turnkey rentals and fix and flips using other people's money. So that's really where I got started in real estate. And really what that did for me was going through that process is realize that a stranger is willing to wire someone fifty, a hundred thousand dollars to someone they don't know for an investment. And before that, I would have never in my wildest dreams imagined that was a possibility that you could do that, that people would do that. But once I kind of knew that, it really started to get my wheels turning. It really started to get the scalability of real estate going in my head because before that, my idea of how I was going to get started in real estate and really grow was, all right, I'm going to save up for a down payment on maybe a duplex, live in one half, rent out the other side maybe a few years down the road, refinance, get another property. But to me, that was just like such a long game. And plus I need active income anyways to build up right. and get to there. So it's like I have to work three, four, five years to get to that first down payment anyways. And so once I kind of see that you could use other people's money and that you could scale and I could get into things through pretty much sweat equity, it really started getting my wheels turning. So I worked for him for a while, ended up going to um, 10X Growth Con, which is Grant Cardone's mm. event. And he's a he does syndications and so that's kind of when the idea of syndication was brought to me and mind you I kind of had this idea before I actually heard the word syndication I was like well there's bigger properties out there and you could put together a few investors and go buy something bigger maybe go buy an apartment complex like I had that kind of idea in my head but I didn't know there was a word right. for it and that people were right. doing it so once he kind of syndication is a thing I kind of ran with that so I started listening to all the books all the podcasts I could find on syndication I took his course on on what syndication is, and that's kind of how I got started into real estate in general, and then into the multi. Oh, that's method. so awesome! I I did not know you went to a, a growth con event. Um, it's funny that you're on this uh, channel because one of the only other real estate investors I've had on this channel, Cody Davis, who is on Bigger Pockets, is younger than both of us and got I believe it was 81 doors by age 22. And he also went to a growth con event and referenced in his bigger pockets episode the the 10x by Grant Cardone. So I just thought that was funny that you also uh, accumulated a lot of doors in a quick span, and there was that one common denominator. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, but next question I have for you is: with all that, what was the biggest obstacle in getting started with that? So you got. I know how we know how you got started and kind of what got you interested, you know, the one successful friend of your mom's and then going to Grant Cardone event and really solidifying, OK, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to do this and it's called syndication. But what was the biggest obstacle to actually break through? Yeah, so I would say the biggest obstacle is back when I first started in the single family space and started working for that guy. Um, the biggest thing was just like getting on the phone with someone. Like, I don't know why that, that scared me so much, but, but I was doing kind of just some discovery calls for him, kind of reaching out to potential investors and 
creating that initial conversation, creating some rapport, kind of figuring out what their situation and their goals were, which looking back, that's probably the best thing I could have learned how to do and get over that fear. But it was really that. And then just the self-limiting beliefs too, of just like, you, I always put so many, like you just, I, I'm like, you can't do that. Like that's not going to work or just that, that even 90% of the population, when you, when you talk about certain things, will tell you it's not going to work. And it's like, it, it, you're kind of going against the grain as a real estate investor. And that's one thing I kind of had to learn along the way was that like, you just got to trust your gut, trust your instincts, trust what you've learned up to this point. And like, no matter what people are going to say, people are going to speak from experiences of their own, whether those are good or bad or, or whatever, but really just take advice from the people that are where you want to be. And, and those people tend to think differently than the mass majority, at least for the people I want to be. Like, yeah, so. no, exactly. If you ask most people, they're going to say all the negatives about real estate. They'll even say, I know people that invest in real estate and here's all the problems that you probably haven't thought of. Um, but they, they yeah. always fail to, to mention or fail to, to realize that that person keeps buying real estate <laughs> despite all those complaints about it. They're, they're probably just complaining to you to assimilate and not brag or come off the wrong way because you don't want to talk to them about that more often than not. <laughs> yeah, I think the statistic is like 90% of the world's millionaires own real estate. So, I mean, when you hear things like that, it, it really gets you like, okay, I'm in the right asset class. I'm in the right place. Like, I know there's some merit to what I'm Yeah, doing. exactly. And even taking it a step further, um, even our you know political leaders own a big majority of real estate. So when you think about long-term safety and regulations and laws protecting real estate investors, well, you got a bunch of real estate investors that are in the White House voting on laws. So uh, it, it's a safe bet for me too. I think I was fearful about that being an Oregon real estate investor, especially. But then when I was like reassured and saw articles about how every single Congress person at least owns two properties or more, I was then like, okay, you know, there's no way they would get so harsh. They, they can't, it would be everyone voting against themselves in, in that case. Yeah. So yeah, no, real estate's an awesome one. I think the other stat is seven or eight income streams. Every millionaire has a, an average of seven or eight income streams. So maybe yeah. some have like yeah. 20 or 30 or a bunch of micro streams and some have five or six, but the average being seven. Yeah, and kind of kind of going back to what you just said about the, the political scene, one thing I, I've always heard, listened to a lot of podcasts and just people talk about in general, you can just kind of see evidence of it too is like, Real estate is such a backbone of the economy and real estate transactions have to continue. And if they slow down or they even stop, like 2008 happens, like real estate is so important to the economy and that those transactions continue that when, when real estate gets slowed down, there, there's major problems, bigger problems than, than just what's happening in the real estate market. And so that usually leads to them putting in, you know, things in place that, that keep those, that ball rolling for real estate. If, if things are gonna go where it would slow down or even stop that that real estate transactions, they're gonna push to pass laws and regulations that are gonna keep those things moving. And that's why there's so many great tax benefits too. It's like they incentivize people to buy and to sell real estate. Right, yeah, like they, for a half a second, they uh, mentioned um, abolishing the, the 1031 or, or making the, the, the tax come due. Not, not even abolishing mm -hmm. it. They just actually made it come due. They were talking about making it come due for the, you know, inheritors, the people that get the uh, properties. And even that was kiboshed really quickly. And I thought, oh, that was kind of a sensible law. You know, the, there are taxes there. And there, even then, they're like, no, let's not take money there. <laughs> so I, that's really yeah. interesting. Um, but next question I have for you is now that you're established, you know, you have multiple doors, you've been at it for a few years. What are your goals? Cause it doesn't look like you've stopped investing. You're not done at 134. This isn't your end goal. I, I don't think. Yeah. So originally my, my goal this year was, was to get to 500 doors. Um, the, the deal, the, the 134 unit kind of fell into a little bit into this year. And so I haven't been able to move as quickly as I'd like to, but I still think it's something that's possible. 
It's kind of one of those things if you shoot at the moon, you land among the stars type of thing. Not not getting overly aggressive with your goal setting, but um, but yeah, and then also the deals I'm working on are in a different market now, or at least the ones I'm, I've been looking at, where the market I was, the price per door was way cheaper, so you could get a lot more doors for a smaller purchase price and smaller amount, versus now the price per door is gonna be higher, but you know there's more appreciation and things like that involved. So it's a little bit, different i'm still on my way to my goal um obviously it's money is the goal and the financial gain of it and so that will be beneficial either way it doesn't the number of doors doesn't always mean that someone is super rich like someone could own a 20 unit apartment complex and be making just as much as someone that has 400 doors like sometimes that doors number is very misleading um and, and how much they own of it how much they're invested into it how much of a stake they have in it is, is important as well right too. so for you more of a more of a retirement plan is like the future goal yeah. for it like the number of doors is secondary to the lifestyle that you can create via the funds right so like whatever door number who cares best retirement you know income that's the real goal here yeah, my, so my, I guess the best way to put it is my kind of three to five year kind of goal or my outstanding goals hit my financial freedom number, which I, I would think it's kind of calculated around two million. Um, I think I could be super comfortable with that in, in terms of just investing in other private placement and private equity deals, being able to just invest and live off of the returns of those deals. That's just, you know, once I have that, I could never have to work again if I didn't want to. And so... From there, it's just how big of an empire do I want to build? How much of a brand or impact do I want to make with that? And I've already I've already started to do those things where you think about more than just yourself. You start to think about, okay, well, what's going to come after this? What I, I'm doing these things, but I kind of want to make these things impactful. I want these things to be good. I want these things to improve the world around me and help other people, not just, you know, make a buck. So it's more of those things that have been coming to, to me recently of, of, you know, I really should be thinking about that more long term of like the philanthropic, philanthropic, philosophical, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like doing better for the world. But yeah. Yeah. No, that, so that's, no, that, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, I think the, the last question I have for you is, let's see. Yeah. So, all things considered, you're you're in. Those are your goals. Someone else looking in that wants to get started in real estate investing, whether it be full time or part time, depending on if they have a, a good job or another full career. What opportunities are you seeing in the market, just in general? Yeah. So one thing, and this is a little bit biased, kind of partly what I do, but I think one of the biggest things people don't realize is that you can passively invest into real. Estate. And this isn't just with a REIT where it's some big corporation that you never even know what property necessarily you own. It's just a big fund Like you can actually buy into the apartment complex down the road from you or the Starbucks down the road from you. And people don't even as little as 25, 50 K sometimes you can get into those deals and make 15, 20, 25 percent a year with all the tax benefits, with cash flow and things like that. So I think that there's a big like there's not there's not enough education around that private placement deals are out there and and just the accessibility to them because some of them most of them if you see them advertised actually all of them if you see them advertised online um you most likely have to be accredited unless it's a reg a and so the 506 b is the ones we don't necessarily have to be accredited to invest in those aren't being publicly advertised so unless you know someone doing these deals, you're never going to be exposed to them or the ones you are exposed to, you won't actually be able to invest in. So I think if people just kind of reached out a little bit more and, and just looked up syndicators and operators, there's a lot of operators that do 506B raises. And so if you get on their list and you create that pre-existing relationship with them, you can invest in those deals without being accredited. So I think a lot of people too that are full-time, um, especially if you have a high paying job and you're a high earner, sometimes it makes sense more instead of taking away that earnings and trying to focus your time on real estate and trying to build it from the ground up, keep that job for a few years, get passively invested, get a good base behind you. And, and then you can step away from the job once your passive income is kind of taken over that active income. And then you can start being an active person and you already have this, this already little golden nugget of all these passive investments you've made and they're, they're paying you still. And if you just want to be a passive investor for life, a lot of people end up doing that. The active side of real estate, 
is another job. As much as people try to say it's this grand thing, you're you're you have to do something. You have to show up somewhere. You have to talk to someone. You have to do something. It's still responsibility on your plate. Where a passive investment, it's mailbox money. You send your money away, and you get a distribution check every three right. months, and your tax benefits come on your K one form, and it's a it, it's super super easy for those people that are passively invested. Right. And obviously. And obviously the, the difficult part of passively investing is doing the research and, and really vetting and understanding the deals and what's a good deal and what's not, who's a good operator, who's not. But there's a lot of resources out there too on how to be a good passive investor, what to look for in an operator. And so the same way people are learning how to wholesale or learning how to flip homes, they could go be learning how to be a great passive investor. Right. And I think too, the, the benefit if you want to do the active investing side is you're more likely to, to find a mentor that way. Uh, otherwise, if you're trying to do it part time, it's really hard to get some of the, the top tier real estate investors to bring you under their wing because there's plenty of people that want to work full time for them and they have to give their time to these full time employees, especially if they have 50, 60 employees that's going to take up most of their time with real estate investing, uh, if not all of it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think the thing about a mentor too is like, don't be afraid to, to pay for a mentor. I know people always say that, but spend money on your education, spend money on getting to events where around people. Like I think the guy you brought up, Cody Davis, and the reason we both mentioned 10 X just because when you get around people that are doing it, it, it takes away this veil of like, it's out of a realm, something I can do, right? Yeah. When you meet someone and you talk to them for an hour and you're like, this guy owns 130 units, I could totally do what he does. He's not any smarter, any more clever, any more personable than me. He's just a guy who just believed he can did it and went out and, and do it. So I, I think a mentor will help you. That's when I say self-limiting beliefs, I think a mentor, that's the main thing they do is they help just give you the confidence in yourself. They help you give help you feel more confident because you feel like you have someone looking over your shoulder that's going to direct you in the right way versus just like i said in the beginning just trusting that gut instinct which is hard for some people to do it's very hard it, it took a lot of trial and error and there was times my gut was wrong and i had to kind of swallow that and go back and, and relook at things but then it also makes you just trust your gut more next time because you you know better the next time right no that's awesome that's awesome and I guess last but not least, all I have is what opportunities are, are you looking for in the, the real estate world or just in general? And then where could people reach at? Yeah, so in the real estate world, I am I love looking, I love talking to investors. Um, that's a big part of my, my job and my day is, is just talking to investors and providing them great opportunities that I've vetted and, and looked at myself. Um, the best way to probably reach me is through social media. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, I'm on YouTube, um, Instagram. Um, and yeah, I have I have a Calendly link as well on, on all those pages. So you can go and book a call and, and be happy to chat that way. Um, yeah, but and yeah, I'll link everything media. down in the description below too. So if you're, if you're listening or watching, links in the description for Dooney. And then Calendly on all of the socials you said? Yeah, it should be in my bio for pretty much all of them. If not, just shoot me a DM and I'll pretty much respond to anyone's um, direct message that they send me. Perfect. Well, hey, Dooney, thanks for coming on the YouTube channel. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure.